1945, August the 6th, the same day, the same year, the same month that the United States dropped the first bomb on Hiroshima. My mother used to say there were two bombs that were dropped on that day, and my son was one of them. The, the mass meetings was a chance to blow off some steam without blowing off somebody's head. The threatening thing about it is that they knew that once they left outside that door, they might be subject to all kinds of racist acts. In my own mind, I never questioned the presence of God. I did question the hurt that was being endured by a lot of folk that I saw and I heard about. Bishop Ernest Palmer grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, deep in the heart of the Jim Crow South. He was graduated from Stillman College and served in the Marine Corps during the days of Vietnam. He applied to the University of Alabama Law School, was accepted, but later turned down on the trumped up charge that he didn't have a good enough vocabulary. He started a choir that helped ignite the civil rights movement in Tuscaloosa. Bishop Palmer remembers the struggle of the civil rights movement and the impact that struggle has had on our world today. This is the story of a man who started a choir that helped change the course of the civil rights movement. This is the story about a man who after seeing injustice after injustice, never questioned the presence of God. My mother was a musician for the choir, and one of the things you have to understand about the civil rights movement during that time is that everything was pretty well centered around the church. The church was a vital force in the community. Uh, I used to tell people that when you meet a white guy on the street and ask him for the first time, and your conversation goes past 14 sentences, you're going to ask what country club he was a member of, what golf course he played on. But when you meet black people, you want to know what church did you attend. And that became our country club, if you will, uh, experience. And so uh, my sister and my mother were actively involved in that choir, and the choir was used as a tool to draw people to the church. In many ways, I was sheltered from the movement in Birmingham. There were so many kids that were actively involved in it, some being beaten up and bruised and even killed. Because of the dangers involved, his parents did not want him to be part of the civil rights movement. They thought he'd be better off in school. Ernest Palmer's high school guidance counselor was Dr. John Rice, the father of Condoleezza Rice, who would later serve as Secretary of State for George W. Bush. I went to to a high school called Oldman High School, Samuel Oldman High School. The guidance counselor at that high school was a guy by the name of John Rice, who was a pastor of a local Presbyterian church. John Rice became the dean of students at Stillman College and recruited me to attend Stillman as opposed to Morehouse, where I had been planning to go. John Rice, the daughter of John Rice, is Condoleezza Rice. And so Condoleezza and I had some involvement with, in terms of knowing each other early on before all this became fashionable and before, she, before the family, their family moved to Colorado. So there I was at Stillman College, and I was told by the parents not to get involved in any civil rights movement, go ahead and finish and get my degree. I want to go to law school. I um, tried to do what they said. Well, they found out that I was a musician, and so I started a choir on a Stillman College campus, and I bring it up only because it was unusual to have uh, a non-college affiliated choir on a college, on a black college campus. It became competitive in the sense that we got invited to do more appearances than the college choir, and that kind of created a little enmity between me and the college director, choir director, but they allowed us to continue. It ended up being that the, our gospel choir became the uh, backup choir for the Tuscaloosa Civil Rights Movement, 
And so at First African Baptist Church, when they wanted the so-called professional sound, then we were called in to provide the music along with the one, the T.Y. Rogers Chapel Choir, which uh, toured with him. But we were there to draw the folk in from in the locale. While Stillman College did not encourage student involvement in the civil rights movement, Ernest Palmer still found himself involved through the choir. Uh, it was a hostile environment during that time. So uh, when I say hostile, what I mean by that is that we attended Stillman College, all of us, and the administration at Stillman College did not encourage us to be involved in anything that might defame Stillman College. Stillman was owned and operated by the Presbyterian Church U.S., and a great part of its money uh, came to came from the Presbyterian Church. A lot of the scholarships came, and I was a I was a um, prospective minister, uh, Presbyterian minister. I wasn't Presbyterian, but they were trying to recruit Presbyterian ministers, and scholarship was based on that. And, I, and since Dean Rice was Presbyterian, obviously I was involved in that. And so, but our dean of students, Dean Hardy, did not encourage us to get involved in it at all. The French philosopher Victor Hugo said, one does not resist an idea whose time has come. Every night there was a gathering on campus in what was then our student union. It was a one-room building on, on campus and we get a chance to get together with the girls from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. After that, we had to head back to the dorms. And that was a routine thing, for, but it was also a gathering place and an informational setting for what was going on in the community. Everybody found out what was going on. We had what was known as city students and the campus students. So the city students would come on campus to share with us the kinds of things that were going on. We were not allowed to go off campus. Uh, for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was because of the advent of the Klan. Some of the guys that were with us on campus got involved in the local movement. And I remember so vividly that we sat in at a restaurant down the hill from Stillman College. And I guess you can say we sat in. We really didn't sit anywhere, just, even though the restaurant was open. Had a window in the back for blacks to come down and get the barbecue and the chicken and so forth, we went to the wrong window. For us, the right window. There was a right window for us, a wrong window for the times. As a result of that, the police were called, and they came and ran us away from that restaurant. We were located about a block and a half from Stillman College. When we got back on the campus, the word went out that the Klan was coming to Stillman College to find those guys and girls that had been at that restaurant. I was one of them. I remember the guys went in the dorm and got broom handles and hammers and everything they could find to come out there waiting for the clan to show up. And we were brazen enough to say, if you come on this ground, we're going to turn it around. Before they got there, the police got there first, but before they got there, the dean showed up and the president of the college dean, uh, Dr. Hay, who was a white college president then, and cautioned us not to do that, but to handle it in a different way. But nobody ever came up with a reason, as a way as to how it could be handled. Uh, we, we dispersed, went back to our dorm places, but in our minds, it was still there. And the reason it was still there is because the next night, one of the students riding a motorcycle got attacked by the Klan near that same restaurant and was beaten pretty badly. Um, that didn't sit well with the campus students. While Stillman College did not encourage student involvement in the civil rights movement, they played an important role in a historical event. On June 11, 1963, George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama to block the admission of two students, Vivian Malone and James Hood. It was interesting because James Hood was in my fraternity, and I had met him before. 
Vivian uh, had gone to Alabama A&M uh, and came down, and the, the place for their meeting to plan what they were going to do with Nicholas Katzenbach and others who were part of the standing in the door experience was on the campus of Stillman College. Uh, the groundwork, a lot of that groundwork was planned down there, I mean on the campus. The governor leaves, James Hood is the first of his race to become a University of Alabama student. Those plans made at Stillman proved to make the stand in the schoolhouse door the successful walk through the schoolhouse door. He is followed into the registrar's office by Vivian Malone. Both the students are 20 years old and will take summer courses. The First African Baptist Church was an important part of the Civil Rights Movement in Tuscaloosa. The church needed a new minister. Dr. Martin Luther King thought that Reverend T.Y. Rogers was the right man for the job. In 1963, T.Y. Rogers and his family moved to Tuscaloosa. I was at First African Baptist Church when T.Y. Rogers was installed. My choir was asked to bring the music. And I never will forget the multitude of people that had gathered at that church. The crowd was wall to wall. They were all outside the door, very much the way it was as they has been described in the so-called Buddy Tuesday. T.Y. Was, was associated with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference when Dr. King. There was a need for somebody to locally deal with the issues of segregation that existed at that time. And there was not enough leadership coming from, I think, the local churches to really uh, bring the church members into that kind of unity. He was able to do that. The local pastors were actively involved with them, some of them outwardly, others, others sort of secretly. Uh, the local Lutheran pastor was involved, and, and uh, Reverend Linton was involved, and uh, a number of pastors, I won't go ahead and try to name all of them, but I remember them uh, so vividly during that time, uh, because where there, there was a unity of thought about what had to be done, the question was how, what kind of approach to use. Even though Bishop Palmer was a grown man and part of the movement, he was still mystified about why white was good and black was second class. I remember one day we went down to the county courthouse and they had the water fountains down there. One of them was labeled colored, another one was labeled white. I had this urge to figure out how white, what white water tasted like. And while somebody else distracted the local people, uh, drank that water and then went on to the, water, the colored water fountain and realized it was the same water, coming out of the same faucet, just out of different faucets. And, and how ridiculous that was. But during the time that the girls were killed at 16th Street, um, I remember it so vividly because my mother called me and told me what had, ha had transpired. Um, and was trying to make sure that I wasn't going to be involved. By that time, the news events were beginning to play on the black and white TVs that existed during that time, and the story was being told over and over again, and it spread like wildfire here in Tuscaloosa. And there was an anger that took place, mainly because of the innocence of the girls and the travesty of, of the Klan boasting about what they had done. And I think it created in a lot of people my age the incentive to become more active, to do whatever it could in the, in the loss of, of life. Any member of the African American community who had been reluctant to get involved in the civil rights movement was moved to action after the murder of the four little girls at 16th Street Baptist Church. My mother's mother maternal grandmother, had a house in Birmingham, and the church across the street from, from our house was where the lineup was held to march down to City Hall. It was, uh, 
I call it a trick march because the actual march was supposed to start at downtown, probably bound by 16th Street Church. But the real march with masses of people occurred within uh, 100 yards of our house. And everybody marched downtown a different way and converged on City Hall in protest of that event. It struck a nerve in me. And I remember the tears falling from my sister's eyes as she tried to recite to me the impact on her and on everybody else at what had happened. I, can, I could understand death. I mean, I understood that death, but I didn't understand the magnitude of the death and what it meant. And I think that death there perhaps did as much as what took place over the Edmund Pettus Bridge or what took place in Jimmy Lee Jackson's death in Marion. And uh, I think about that. If the church was the heart of the civil rights movement, music was the heartbeat of the movement. The singing uh, was very vitally important. It, it allowed the people in the audience to embrace it. And then, of course, uh, with, with my background in music and, and some of the songs that are being used in Birmingham, we just changed the lyrics for Tuscaloosa. You know, uh, and we would sing those same songs, which became vital parts of the movement, the marches that were done uh, as they walked down the various streets. So uh, they, would, they, they would lift up an offering, or an offering, or take a collection, raise some money, because the, the, the reason for the money was more or less to take care of bail money and for attorneys that had to be uh, uh, compensated where necessary. There were a number of attorneys, particularly white attorneys, who serve for free. And uh, that was interesting. We, we never knew that. Uh, but they were vitally, they knew that what the Constitution provided for. They knew what the rights that were being fought for. And that was the way that they were able to make their statement. It wouldn't do them any good to go out there and try to march. And some of them did, though. Most of those marches that were white came from other places, other locations. Um, Stillman had begun to integrate its student body, very minuscule. So some of those people became involved in it. And uh, the others who got involved with Stillman and ended up going down to, uh, who, had, who had come out of the Green County movement, uh, had come and become involved in Tuscaloosa as well. And so the, the mass meetings was a chance to blow off some steam without blowing off somebody's head. The threatening thing about it is that they knew that once they left outside that door, they might be subject to all kinds of racist acts. There were always the rumors that the Klan was sitting outside waiting and that, they, that people driving cars would be followed to their homes, uh, followed to find out where they worked. And there was always that threat that went on, but people attended. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't get in the building because there were so many folks that were there. Now, it was not representative of the population. But the population had no way of getting there. The greater part of the population did. You had students there. You had adults there um, who didn't have anything to lose. Um, you had adults there that were following their pastors. And, and it served to provide a good informational outlet to what was going on. During his senior year at Stillman, Bishop Palmer decided he could make a difference as an attorney. He applied to the University of Alabama Law School. At first, he was accepted, but then someone on the committee had second thoughts, claiming this most eloquent man did not have a sufficient vocabulary. It was hard to believe because had I arrived on the campus uh, in 1965, I probably would have been the first black student to have enrolled in law school. I went back and I tried to check my record on that, the acceptance letter I found it many years ago. Um, at the, at the, at the, at the fact, I think law school was on Farrar Law uh, Hall, I believe, at that particular time. And I remember having an interview in which somebody said, well, your vocabulary does not seem sufficient to be successful 
in attending the University of Alabama Law School. Well, that bothered me for a minute, you know. But before I could really get actively involved in, in, in enrollment, I got uh, drafted to the Vietnam War, and I was supposed to go to the Army. I refused to go to the Army and went up, ended up going to the Marine Corps. When he couldn't get into law school, he applied to Livingston. He wanted to be a teacher. I was in the first graduate program at Livingston University. It's now called um, University of West Alabama. Um, Livingston was perhaps the last predominantly white campus in Alabama that was probably integrated. And I came in on a program called the National Teacher Corps. It was a program designed by U.S. Office of Education to put more people from diverse backgrounds in the Black Belt schools. And one of the first instances I had when the, the white students found out that the, there were at least three more black students on campus, there was no, we had to all eat in the same lunchroom, but they made sure they would eat nowhere near us. And one day, as I walked in front of the student union building, I think it was Graves Hall, I believe, somebody threw out some cooking flour on me. I had on a black suit and said the words, since you want to be white, take this. And I looked up and all that powder came on me. I was so angry. Now, my home was Birmingham, and um, the neighborhood that I came from, you didn't initiate a fight unless you were ready to go all the way through with it. And you were destined to be the one to walk away. So I took off trying to get to the person that threw that on me. I didn't know who it was. About two floors up. And my dean, Dean Orr, stopped me from going up those stairs. I was determined not to allow that kind of transgression of my freedom to take place uh, in that kind of setting. And um, it happened. The next couple of days they spent time trying to smooth things over and trying to get me to understand the, the hostilities that still existed in communities, which I had been uh, reasonably sheltered from. The, the, the mass meetings that we talked about were always God-centric. Uh, the songs, God is on our side, we, we, we always sang those things at the end of the mass meeting. So we left there with the presence and the essence of God on our minds. Now, regardless of what happened once we got outside those doors and somebody, you know, confronted us, you know, we left there with that kind of flavor and intent. But, but in my own mind, I never questioned the presence of God. I did question the hurt that was being endured by a lot of folk that I saw and I heard about, like the deaths of the girls in Birmingham, uh, like the boy being beaten up uh, at, the, at the restaurant here in Tuscaloosa or about any number of instances that I knew of that took place. I questioned it, but there's a passage in Scripture that says all things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and who are called according to His, you know, who, who are called according to His purpose. So there, there was a purpose and an intent in all that was, that was going through at that time. We couldn't see it. But then I thought that you never see purpose, and you sort of never see God's purpose. Uh, you see his hand in those things, but you never really fully understand the purpose while you're going through it. It's only after you reach certain benchmarks that you look back and say, this is why I'm here. This is for the reason for which I've been assigned, or the purpose for which I've been assigned, or the reason that I've had to endure what I've had to endure. Sometimes it doesn't give you any consolation, but most of the time it gives you a reassurance that it was not in vain. 
a lot of things took place in Tuscaloosa that people don't know that were very quietly kept. But I think a lot of what's going on now in terms of recapturing that history is going to bring a lot of recollections that have sent that have had been covered up or uh, hidden, maybe even forgotten, but certainly ignored.